So in this video I'm going to talk a bit about photons and then later on get into onto talking about how they're related to annihilation and pair production. So some basics that you should already know about photons. So you should know that they're the energy carriers for the electromagnetic spectrum. So any kind of wave, whether it be gamma, light, radio, whatever, the energy in them is carried in photons. And you should also know that the higher frequency radiation, the higher the photon energy. So gamma radiation, really high frequency, really high photon energy. Radio, really low frequency, really low photon energy. And that should kind of make sense because we have radio waves zipping around us all the time and we don't really want high energy waves constantly zipping around. So that kind of makes sense in terms of the way we use different kinds of waves. And you should know how to convert between frequency and wavelength using V of the V, so that's the speed, this will be the speed of light in the case of these. Frequency is the number of waves per second and lambda being the wavelength. So let's just quickly summarize that. So if we have a wave here, it's not the best. Okay, so in terms of this, we have the wavelength there and Frequency is going to be the time is going to be the number of waves per second, which is going to be one over the time for one wave. Okay, and then V in this case is going to be because they're electromagnetic waves, going to be C or the speed of light. One of the things you may or may not know: photons are actually a type of boson, so that changes the different rules that govern their behaviour. You should know the virtual photons, the exchange particle for the electromagnetic interaction, because I've covered that in previous videos. And another thing, photons have zero rest mass, but they do have some momentum. So a lot of people get very confused as to how, if photons have zero mass, why they get pulled into black holes and that sort of thing. But they do have some momentum, but zero rest mass. Okay, so there's a very important scientist at this point, a guy called Max Planck. And he was one of the first scientists to propose that energy is quantized. And certainly if he wasn't the first, he was the first to really believe it. Because he did this experiment where he was aiming to basically disprove it. And when he found out that he couldn't do that, he had to, was forced to accept that energy is quantized. So it's in packets of energy rather than in a continuous wave of energy. So from his experiments, he actually proposed that the energy of a photon is proportional to the frequency. So his first proposal was just simply energy is proportional to frequency, which is something you should have come across already. Which he managed to demonstrate through experimentation. But what he managed to uh, prove is more than that, is that actually if you say is proportional to f, that would mean there would be a constant multiplying the f. And this constant got named after Max Planck, and it's called the Planck's constant. This doesn't come out very well when it's got imported, but it should be 626 six, times 10 to the power of minus 34 joule seconds. So that's a tiny, tiny constant. And you might also have heard about something called Planck length, which is the shortest possible wavelength any kind of radiation the electromagnetic spectrum has, and that's of this sort of order of size as well. So once we had this proposal, we had this Planck's constant of proportionality between the photon energy and the frequency, but they weren't actually called photons at this point. That didn't come along till later when Einstein proposed the photon model. So what you end up with is the final equation for photon energy is that E equals HF, where this is Planck's constant. So the symbol of Planck's constant is H in its equation. So frequency measured in hertz, this is measured in joule seconds, and then energy obviously is measured in joules. So you can see, if you think about it, um, hertz is the number of waves per second, so it would have 1 over second units. So when you multiply it by the seconds, you end up with joules, so that makes sense. So how does this relate to annihilation and pair production? So what we should know is that in annihilation, when a particle and an antiparticle pair meet, their mass is converted into energy because mass and energy are interchangeable by that famous old equation. And the next thing you should know is that you get two photons being produced. Okay? So if you want to work out what the energy of those photons is, 
you can work out the total mass energy that the particles have, you can work out the total kinetic energy that the particles have. And then this would give you the total energy available to the photons, but each would get half of that energy. Okay, so that's annihilation. Pair production is different because it's just one photon this time producing a particle-antiparticle pair. So you know that the total mass energy plus the total kinetic energy of the particles afterwards is going to be equal to the photon energy. But remember that this is going to be um, two sets of masses. One's the particle and then obviously the antiparticle. So you need to remember to take into account the masses of both. And again, the kinetic energy would be shared between them. So it's important to remember that the photon has to be basically split between those two masses.